Hey everybody, I'm Dane Sanders. I want to welcome you to episode 127 of uh, Fast Track Coaching. I'm getting a little um, echo in my ear shant, if you could check in on that. But I'm really pleased to have our guest today. His name is Julian, uh, Julian Smith. Uh, has the coolest Twitter handle I know because it's his only his first name. I think only the founder at Twitter and he are that cool. Um, and he also happens to be the co-author of Trust Agents uh, with Chris Brogan. Uh, you guys are familiar with the book. Um, and if you aren't, you should be. We'll be talking about this today. And I'll bring him on in just a second. But if you've not been to Fast Track Coaching before, let me explain a little bit about what we do. It's about a 30 minute conversation. Uh, we're not trying to solve the world's problems. What we're trying to do is help you move your business just a little bit further today, this week. If you get a couple nuggets uh, to help with your creativity, uh, your business acumen, anything, and it moves things forward, then that's a win in our book. Um, and I think that stuff that is acted on is way better than uh, things that you just think about or, or are learning theoretically. Our interest is to help you today, right now. And honestly, I'm the biggest benefactor in this whole thing. I get to get in these amazing conversations. Again, this is episode 127, so uh, I've been very privileged to be in these dialogues. And really, the the invention here is to have you guys be able to listen in, uh, almost in a not in a creepy voyeuristic way, really in a way that you can jump into the conversation. So today, as I get to dialogue with our guest, uh, my invitation is for you to not just and you'll find that. The more you do that, the more you will be, the again, the, the benefactor. So, so there's a couple ways to do that. One, you can just ask a question. Uh, the second is you can actually link up your video camera and you can jump on with us. Uh, but again, we're on this call very quickly and we'll be off quickly uh, before you know it. So the sooner you jump in with your questions, if you have them, uh, or just make yourself known, the better. Uh, but without further ado, by the way, thank you, Sean, for fixing the echo thing because it went away. Um, let me introduce you guys. This is uh, Julian Smith. Julian, uh, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. You know, uh, you and I met a while back, uh, right after Trust Agents came out. You were speaking at the Harvard Club uh, with with Chris, and um, I, I remember going to that event. I was actually in New York City for an event for in the photography world, which is my genre of, of business, um, called Photo Plus. We were at the Javits Center, and then we, me and a couple of friends, jetted over and saw you guys present. You were in the middle midst of a flurry of activity. But it's amazing for me to think back that that was a long time ago and really trust agents now has been a bestseller and has been out for a long time and i suspect um for those of who are those of the, you who are watching right now you might have just discovered trust agents or maybe um they might be involved in some other projects so i'm wondering julian just as an introduction if you could kind of get us up to speed um uh, i don't think that it's about me at all uh <laughs> i I, um, I think that it's more about the uh, connection that they should have and the sort of situation that they are in more than anything. And I'll tell you what that situation is in a moment. I think it's like basically we're the first generation in the world in the world who not only have access to uh, an infinite number of channels to uh, to watch and pay attention to, but also the first generation to be able to also be the producers of those channels as well. And this is a really sort of powerful, you know, I don't want to be like, it's not the invention of the wheel or anything, but at the same time, what it is, is, is it's a unique situation in history where, you know, like people have previously, you know, they had access to, during the industrial revolution to a bunch of sort of machinery and a bunch of manpower and a lot of different things were happening at the same time that all deeply influenced the people who were then, you know, nobodies but who came into power you know people like i don't know henry ford like thomas edison all these inventors that you hear about these are famous names but back in the day they were nobody so this is our situation it's our own unique situation and it's those of us that have visibility and they're able to gain visibility and able to keep that visibility for i don't know whatever most of their lifetime hmm. can effectively have an inheritance for their children that is non-monetary but still highly valuable hmm. so I don't know that they should be paying attention to me. I, if they're paying, you know, it doesn't even matter if, if, if your audience pays attention to me, my audience pays attention to me, and that's actually all that matters. As long as I grow or keep my audience and get them to spread the ideas that I have, then I'm perfectly good. And then you could do the same with yours, mm -hmm. and all of you watching can do the exact same thing. So that means that 
Hmm. All of you have the ability to gain a great deal of power and a great deal of independence and freedom if you are able to become visible and become trusted and all these other things. Hmm. So that's an incredibly powerful mm -hmm. place to be in if you are willing to take on the hard work that comes with it. Hmm. So what I'm hearing you say on a lot of levels is that our time is unprecedented, that really uh, because of the Internet age and, and what's available on the web, it's actually possible to go from invisible status to visible status. And with that comes a sense of responsibility, not to everybody in the planet, but to the folks that I would be, that I'm trusted by, the, the group of people, people that I'm committed to work, what, I'm, what I should be hearing and what you're saying, because I, I'm compelled by it. I know in my own experience, I'm pretty um, shocked and awed by the, uh, the possibility that anybody would know or care about who I am. And yet there mm -hmm. is um, I, like the way you talked about almost like a legacy, like it's I, I, I do feel a weight of responsibility, like, oh, cool. People know who I am. But so what? Like, what what am I doing to nurture that relationship in such a way that there's there's significant value? Um, so I feel both this yeah. tension. Well, you, you go ahead. because like, I get excited. Just by you're absolutely the right. Idea. It's. You're absolutely right, Dan. It's it's this situation where it is, you know, I mean, I, I have a tendency to speak hyperbolically as well, and I accept this and mm -hmm. sort of know this about myself. But uh, what is going on is is that we do have a kind of unprecedented control. And it's very simple mm -hmm. to sort of think about it and go, oh, well, you know, it's not a big deal, or everyone else has access to this. Or my personal favorite is, well, it was maybe easy for them or hard for me in the sense that, you know, somebody was just discovered at a checkout aisle, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, you are the face of my next makeup campaign. And then all of a sudden, they're, po mm -hmm. they're you know, put across every every poster in North America, all over New York City, mm -hmm. and high, uh, giant 100 foot tall billboards. But this is not the way the world works. The way the world works mm -hmm. is you get what you can take from it, what you mm -hmm. can demand from it. And if you don't demand anything, you will get nothing. And if you have no like faith in yourself or faith that you have any interests uh, to other people, then that's pretty much the level at which you will stay. So uh, maybe it is, and it, it comes with a great deal of like, you know, kind of American arrogance, like I, and I include myself in that, the, the think that this individuality that you have is very important and, and that it needs to be expressed. But mm. the reality is, is that the popul population at large love good stories. They love uh, charismatic individuals. They love uh, personal reflection. They love all these different things. They love a lot of stuff and that you, you are, I mean, you're definitely not an exemplification of all of those things, but you are an exemplification or can become an exemplification of at least one of them. And if you can do that, then you're a good part of the way there. You know, you don't have to be amazing. You just have to be the guy who did, I don't know, shit my dad says or what have you. You know, mm -hmm. that's all you got to do. So... I, I, I'm tempted to ask the question that I know you get asked um, constantly, and it's kind of, I'm realizing though, as we're in the dialogue, that there are some folks that they, they could benefit from this, although it's a bit like um, uh, those questions, or it's like a band that is asked to play their one hit single over and over and over again, but would you answer this question uh, for folks, what, what is a trust agent? Um, wh what do you mean by that, and why would that be? Uh, significant. So I'm nervous that we're making assumptions. Everybody's up to speed on what we mean, and I think that could be helpful to give some context. Okay, so let's start on the expression "trust agent" and why it exists in the first place. Why it deserves to exist. The way that I see it is that we're at this time in history where, for almost no money, uh, anyone can take control of a channel, build the popul popularity of that channel, and can grow to become deeply trusted, uh, even without anything that is professionally interesting to them that it all it requires is a kind of tight connection which can be created largely over the internet although you can't exactly you're not going to be put in anyone's will or anything like that but mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. something can be created and and so the idea of a trust agent is someone if you think about a real estate agent or a real estate agent will I've actually never said this in an interview before, so this is the first mm -hmm. time that I'm trying to express it. A real estate agent is the person who is dealing with a transaction in real estate, let's just say in a general way. That's not entirely, it's, but it's sort of blurrily accurate. A trust agent is someone that deals in trust and that can transfer trust to maybe an organization or to a company mm -hmm. 
or to something like that, or a nonprofit. So if you have a photography company, anything that you personally create and the visibility that you're able to that you're able to obtain will then be something that you can kind of transfer over to your business and that then will help you succeed professionally. So I, I, what's coming to mind as you were answering that was um, this question, like with a real estate agent, I could see, gosh, trust makes a lot of sense. And again, I, I've, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, I'm, I'm in on what you're t describing, but let's say I'm cynical and you're <laughs> describing this and, and, and I go, I'm just an artist. It doesn't matter if the art uh, if the, if the the person who's commissioning that are like me or like they, they they seem to trust my work they don't have to trust me um what would you say to someone who has that kind of objection of like no that might be mine right i mean i could definitely see that and there is no question that you could succeed without those things uh i'm reading mm -hmm. for the nth time right now this amazing book by uh david meister uh charlie green and robert uh, Alfred, hold on. Let me get the book. Okay. <laughs> By the way, as we're waiting for Julian to get back, yeah. uh, I want to just mention. Yeah. Uh, be sure to ask your questions up in the uh, up, upper corner so that we can uh, add you to the show right now. But Julian, tell us about this book. This is the book, The Trusted Advisor. Not entirely what trust agents is sort of based in or whatever, but definitely an influence. And it is written by these are the three amazing gentlemen, David Meister, Charles Green, Robert Galford. Uh, I know two of them personally. They're great guys. But what they talk about is this idea of different things uh, that will enable or facilitate trust. You can still have a, a service firm or you can still sell a bunch of widgets on the Internet and not have the trust that is... Uh, that is, is that we're talking about here, but it certainly facilitates mm -hmm. almost everything. So if you get a bill and you want to be paid mm -hmm. on time, uh, it is better if you're trusted. They won't question or look at everything that's on it. Uh, if they, if you effectively want repeat business and you want referrals, even if it's as simple as that, trust helps with that. And so even if we talk about it, not mm -hmm. even as a transactional sort of situations, but in the sense of, I think, you know, Dan Sanders is cool and I would recommend you listening to his show. That is in and of itself a referral and it's aided by trust. So to me, that is on that a is personal cool. level, the goal that we should be looking for. Hmm. That's helpful. Um, to get one of the things I'm a big fan of is chunking ideas down to an even deeper level. And one of the things I like about, you know, your, your book is it's called trust agents, but the subtext using the web to build influence, improve reputation and earn trust. I'm really interested in this, um, build influence and improve reputation, uh, especially for folks who maybe, maybe they've struggled. Like for example, let's say they got into the business, they started off on the wrong foot, uh, and, and they're, they aren't as trusted as they'd prefer with their target demographic or with people they want to work with. And they're like, you know what, I want to, I want to reset or restart or get back on track. Um, what would you say to folks who are in that position? Uh, cause I'm sure you get this question all the time. What, what, what do you think? You're totally right. Like people have to start somewhere. Right. And, uh, you get these, like, as, as we said earlier on in in this in this sort of interview what we talked about is the idea of uh oh you know for them it was easy but for me it's hard kind of thing like everybody starts with the trust fund and I, it's funny trust fund right uh, but this cyber everybody started for you which is incorrect everybody has to go through this sort of difficult period of making decisions and all of these other things which has a lot mm -hmm. to do, do with the next work that is actually going to come out very soon uh that we're involved in mm -hmm. but uh, what's, what's really like, when I look at that, I, I think improve reputation. So I think it's going to take something that is going to be a certain period of time that is going to be slow, that is going to be doing, that's going to be all of these things, but that in the end will be worth it. So it's like, you're not looking at something that is going to happen instantaneously. You're not looking at something that where all of it can happen. Like I said, you won't end up on somebody's will because of what you do on the internet, but you will have a great deal more capacity than you would have otherwise. Hmm. Hmm. Hypothetically, there's people um, who had a bad experience in the past and, and people are going, uh, well, let me actually, let me reset, state this. Let's say somebody's listening and they go, okay, I, I bought into the idea that 
everyone has to go through this hard beginning stage or if they're resetting their business, this hard reset stage where they're, uh, again, building influence, improving reputation, but, and, they're, and they're owning that they have a starting point and their starting point is where they're at today. And, and yet, let's say that competitors or, or other folks that uh, maybe even are, they're mean. They're trying to erode trust. They're trying to say yeah. like, look, I want to build trust for my sake and the way I'm going to build that trust is I'm going to try to erode or break down how other people are trusting that guy. Um, is is that something you just ignore? Or driving that driving that trust reputation around the folks that are paying attention, or is there some other tactic or consideration that that should be in play? So um, there's a there's an interesting equation which I, I just typed into the chat room there, and you guys can see it if you want to, um, where it talks about what this is called the trust equation, and it's something that's in the book. It's the main factors that come behind why somebody trusts another person. And that happens on a professional level or personal level. But the important part of it is, is you could see all the factors there and I'll sort of write down, since I can type fast, what each of them are. <laughs> and then that's great. Last one is self interest. And by the way, if so the first one, well, just so, uh, yeah, one second, Julian, if you don't mind, if you guys are watching this on the replay, uh, and Julian, I'm sure you'll explain this. Uh, what he's written in the chat room is C times R times I over S, which is credibility times reliability times intimacy divided by self-interest. Uh, that equals trust. So could you, uh, Correct. It's just in case people hadn't had a chance to see this live, um, <laughs> keep going. Right. So uh, it's good. You, you would do have to say it because this, this might not show up later in the chat. So you've got three positive factors. And it's actually interesting because when this trust equation was created and when, when it was popularized, it didn't. It thought that all the factors were the same. Meaning if you had a score from one to 100 on all of these things, that all of them uh, are equally balanced, which is not actually true, but we'll go through each of them and then we'll talk about the balance. Uh, credibility is, is you are who you say you are. You are a lawyer with a law degree. You're not just some guy on the internet talking about law. Uh, reliability <laughs> is the ability to do what you say you will do. So it is consistency. And when you say you're going to bill a certain amount, you bill that amount and not an amount that is larger than that. And then you have intimacy, which is uh, a kind of personal aspect, like the ability to share vulnerability and uh, to expose yourself and all these other kind of personal aspects to trust. And then you have a negative one, which is called self-interest. And it's the only negative one. Uh, Self-interest is the thing that you're talking about, which is if somebody is trying to dissuade you, is trying to dissuade someone else, they pe people are very sophisticated bullshit detectors. You know what I mean, Dane? Like, they all have the ability to find out if someone is self-interested, and if they find out that the self-interested, then they it does in fact work against them. So the best things that you can do is talk in the most honest, frank possible way to dissuade or deter people from thinking that you're being self-interested. And then mm -hmm. you have all three positive factors. And this brings me to what I was going to say, which is that the, what, it, what is, has been shown through studies now is that the most powerful one is in fact intimacy. So that's often like if you get, uh, mm. you know, there's, there's, a pretty, uh, there's a pretty popular saying in the space that we are, which is that people want to do business with the people that they like. And right. all things being not so equal, people still want to do business with people that they like. So they will actually choose a bad contractor that they like and that they're personal friends with over somebody who's a better contractor at a higher cost or what, or even an equal mm. cost. So, so I think the best things that we can do is actually not even think about what other people are doing, but simply work quite like really intensely at taking those mm. three things and bringing them up as high as possible. And if we can do that, mm. then we think about people like Gary Vaynerchuk, very famous for being kind of a self-promoter, or someone like Tim mm -hmm. Ferriss, who is also kind of a famous self-promoter, Who both of, both of which I have a great deal of respect for those people. The reason they're capable yeah. of succeeding in doing that is because they are very good at the top three parts of the equation. So they can be self-interested mm. and still have high trust with people, whereas Somebody else who has uh, high self-interest but not so high intimacy, reliability, or credibility is failing on this test. So it's really about focusing on those four factors. Mm. If it comes to potential clients, comes to existing clients, whatever it is, and uh, 
figuring out tactics for how to improve them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love the examples that you gave and, and, uh, well, the Gary one is particularly interesting to me because he's somebody who, uh, I, I recently just met in, in, in passing and he's probably going to be, I was so impressed with him was I was so unimpressed with him before I met him. Uh, I, I felt like mm. uh, superficially, I found him to be, uh, just, just it, in a way that was, I just thought he was a flash or something. And then I got a little bit closer to him and I realized, oh my gosh, this guy's legit. And not only is he legit, he works harder than almost anybody I've ever seen. Um, and and right. I especially like the way that he deals with self-promotion in that he is overt about it. He just says, hey, just so you know, I'm interested in making a gazillion dollars. I don't want to make a little. I want to buy the New York Jets. Like, by the way he embraces it, that add, it seems to add value value to his brand and I'm a personality like a Gary Vaynerchuk like could somebody listening to this go okay uh, if I'm going to consider all of the kind of components to building trust good self-interest if I owned it in a certain kind of way uh, that's that has integrity I saw that written in the I think it was Michelle or someone wrote uh, that in the chat room uh, could that actually build trust as well when people acknowledge yeah. their, their kind of self-interest mm. in the whole process you're, you're you're absolutely right. It's I the way that I've always thought of this. I actually my my example that I usually use in person, but not in interviews like this. For some reason, I don't know why, is um, is Shoe Money, mm -hmm. who's a very famous Jeremy Schumacher's actual name, but his name is Shoe Money, and he's like a really famous make money online blogger. And most mm -hmm. uh, people inside of blogs, for example, and some of the people listening may be familiar with this, is just like problem with affiliate marketing inside of blogging like you blog but then are you getting paid to blog this thing and should I trust you if you received it for free etc right and so uh, shoe money has a very right. famous uh, well I don't know I don't know, personally quite like epic about page which essentially says I will attempt to sell you or could attempt to sell you at anything at any time and if you mm -hmm. are convinced and you like the product, then I hope you like it. And if you didn't like it, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop trying to sell you stuff. And I will consistently always try to sell you stuff. So at any time, if you click on something and it says that you could be set, you could, should be buying something or what, want to buy something, it is possible that I'm getting paid just to get that out of the way. So that means that right. he is making it known and making it kind of okay and warning people that this is the case and being really frank about it. So I think that the answer is yes. And I think that a lot of us are, or become almost like afraid of our audiences and afraid of the the, hmm. the deep uh, horror that comes with negative attention on the internet. When the reality is, is that just like any other visible people, whether online, any personalities, right. you know, because any web, any personality will inevitably kind of become a web personality. That's kind of an inevitability that will occur over time. So if we think about any kind of visible personality, we have to realize that they are all capable of weathering the storm. You know, John Galliano, I don't like the idea, but John Galliano can say anti-Semitic things in a bar in Paris like he did a few months back. And then you know that like five years or 10 years from now, he's going to come back even bigger than ever in Paris and in fashion by being like the enfant terrible of fashion. And he can do this because he remains visible and because right. his name remains strong. Right. So uh, the reality is, is that uh, we shouldn't be afraid of being transparently and frankly who we are. And having experimented with this quite a great deal, mostly by swearing a lot on my blog, mm -hmm. I find this to be extremely effective. People, right. for some reason, the Frank, and that yeah. goes back to Gary Vaynerchuk also. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, let me ask you this, uh, and this is a, r related to the, the content that we're in right now, because, um, well, I'll just put the question up on, on screen. Lori Kennedy asked the question, what about creating trust in your brand beyond the person behind the brand? Any good suggestions? And I would love for you to extrapolate even further on this around, is there even a distinction between trusting a brand and trusting the person behind the brand uh, uh, if if you're not a major multinational? Like uh, if you're just kind of a small business and it, it, like in my case, my business is danesanders.com and the lens.com or some other thing. Is there a distinction between me and my brand? And then secondly, uh, how do you, is there a different way to 
build trust for a third party brand versus uh, uh, building trust for the personality? I, I personally, I'll, I'll tell you that I haven't seen any studies on it, but I will say that it is unquestionably about the individual and about how what that individual is able to do. They also take on, let's say you've got an agency and you've got five people or something like that. You also take on all the negative, like all the mistakes that occur uh, inside of that organization. So uh, trust is usually in small organizations. It's related to the individuals that you are, that you have at kind of first contact or whatever the contact is. I know personally that even in a multinational or even in a large organization where I'm not, for the most part, not trusted as long as I are not known, sorry, uh, if I have somebody who I know personally, it still helps. But as soon as they're gone, it's like, I don't even care. I don't know them from, from Adam necessarily. It's really about the individual and as an individual, whoever you work for, whether it's yourself or anyone else, you should be working on that trust and those skills, those kind of soft skills um, before you all practically work on anything else. Like, because professional and uh, technical ability only goes so far. There are many other people that can compete with you on a technical level. The human angle is really the angle where we can become the best and is the most appreciated. So to me, that is the natural mm -hmm. place to focus your energies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I love your response because it seems like, especially in our industry for, for photographers, as you might imagine, uh, it's it's like so many things that have been touched by digital. It's instant commodification, and uh, uh, there there is the spectrum of of who is good at at the skill of photography. But uh, it's amazing to me, at least, how resistant many photographers are to embracing the opportunity they have in front of them to distinguish themselves uh, with the characteristics that don't have to do with their skill as a photographer. Uh, and yet, those that do, uh, me being one of them, I get criticized because uh, they'll say some mm. some cynical folks will will say things that, that um, disparage me or my photography or whatever it is. Uh, and, and what they ground their their critique, you know, uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, my friend Jasmine Starr, who's a pretty remarkable photographer, has worked very, very hard. She has a pretty remarkable following online, especially for a wedding photographer. And, um, and people will criticize her or say that She's, you know, she'd say that that's ridiculous. She's, she's fantastic at a whole bunch of things, mostly being herself and letting people in on it. And that, so when someone attractive, people want to support her in that effort. Um, and I don't, I don't even know if I have a question on this, apart from I, I'm in agreement that that, that distinction uh, really does give people an opportunity to crowd and, and to, to look unique. Um, is there anything yeah. that you'd add to that or, or, or what do you think? I mean, I, I'm agreeing with you, and I'm also, I'm going to go further. I'm going to say that, mm -hmm. and I, I think I actually said this at the Harvard Club. That's the first time that I had that idea, and that idea stayed with me all that time, is this idea that everything is going to be commodified. So right now, digital photography is being commodified, and it's, it's, it's like, you know what? I, I don't, I could even not take a, I could go to, to Paris or to Hong Kong next week and not even take a, a picture, a goddamn picture, like once because it doesn't matter. Everyone has taken a, a better shot of every single mm -hmm. tourist thing everywhere. I could just go online <laughs> and just type it in and be like, screw it. So right. the only thing that I can win on is the thing that is not commodified. And the only thing that is not, cannot, is not commodifiable are the basic fundamental human things, which are, for example, mm -hmm. eye contact, the ability to listen, right. And you'd be able to, you know, all of these human things will never be commodified. They can't be expressed through technology, so they can't be digitally uh, multiplied or what have you. So you're left with the one thing that you can really just focus on. And it is transferable across every domain that you in. So you're no longer in wedding photography, fine. You are now, I don't know, a CEO or a public speaker. You have those skills and those skills are just as useful. So I would always focus on the human elements. And I would look at that and go, no matter what happens, no matter where it brings me, I will always have this to sort of fall back on. This is why they say t they tell you to go into sales and spend a year in sales to ensure 
that at any point in your life, you could sell yourself, you could sell, you know, ice to, to the Inuit or something like that, because it's always Eskimos. helpful. Right. That's right. Yeah. So when in doubt, focus on the human element. I, I love that. Uh, in fact, it's really, really interesting. Michelle asked the question, again, in trust with new people. Really, if I'm hearing you right, it's exactly what you just said, that uh, these, uh, to, to veer away from uh, standard digitized techniques and get hand in glove with, with people, like on a human level. And it's interesting, an experiment I've been in the middle of this, this summer is I, I live in a neighborhood fairly affluent neighborhood and I, I'm a, a portrait photographer, so I photograph families. The challenge is the people I want to photograph are my neighbors and I don't want to be an Amway salesman knocking on their door and being known as the guy who sells f photographs to my neighbors. So I feel this sense of, gosh, how do I, if, if really I take your stuff very seriously, how do I build trust with my neighbors? So what I did was I decided to offer a photo class uh, and folk, if you guys are watching online, uh, you can't sign up for it because it's already happened, but you can go to photomadesimple.com and, and see the link to, this, to, to what I did. But really it was to help uh, moms with cameras in the neighborhood take better pictures. And they actually paid me to come into my home and see my studio and, and see my pictures. <laughs> um, and for me to help kind of demystify how to use their camera because that's what they really wanted to do. And they had, kind of, they had all this expensive gear, they didn't know how to use it. And they came in and I put my arm around them and made friends. And and shocker of all shockers, a bunch of them all hired me for this fall to, to take their portraits. And, um, and in retrospect, I look at it, I'm like, I'm smart until I put it in the language that you're describing, because it's really about I the park and, and all of a sudden trust got built. And then that's when they wanted to make, um, a, a, uh, a purchase, um, but it's so funny. This is so narcissistic of me. Here I was putting up Michelle's question and then answering it for you uh, out of my own experience. That's pretty lame. So, so yeah, you you're, me you're right. <laughs> yeah, of course. You're, you're totally, of, of course. It's, it's really about uh, trying to work on low self-interest to reduce the kind, of, um, the kind of friction. This is one way that I like to refer to it a lot is talking about friction. What, is the, what are the frictions between you and a sale? And sometimes... Uh, there are technological frictions or uh, real life frictions such as uh, distance or such as cost for shipping something or I don't know, whatever it is, you know. And then sometimes there's friction, which are which are human frictions. And all you have to do, this is also how I create content, by the way, in case anyone's wondering, if you're creating content and you're trying to create content mm. to get either the interest of photographers or to get the interest of a public that will eventually sell something to you uh, or buy something from you, what you have to do is kind of get drunk and then write down whatever happens to be the funniest stuff that you end up, you know, saying that night. So you get really, really blissed with a bunch of friends and then write out, write whatever happens to be funniest. In our case, uh, for about six hours last night, we were driving back from New York and we were coming up with names for our new dog. And so the most epic name that we could come up with, I mean, there were hundreds of them, but was something like Bacon Bear uh, Washington as a name for like a little puppy. But it came out, it was like, oh, what do you want to call it? Like Organ Failure Washington. And then we were like, oh, Laser Washington. For some reason, they all have Washington. I couldn't, I don't know why. But it's uh -huh. doing this kind of thing and somehow creating that epic content is always going to turn back to something that you think is radically interesting and amazing. So you have mm -hmm. to do that in order to be able to sort of catch attention. Anyway, whatever. yeah, I know we're, we're like, laughing at all this stuff right here. Thank you, Chris. I, I love doing media hacks. Sorry, I know there's a bunch of stuff going on here. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to cover this. But I think the most important thing is the human, human contact is key. Human contact will never be commodified. And it is the one transferable skill across everything you'll ever do. So it is the one thing to that you really have to work on. And it all comes down to getting trust. And once you have it, you can kind of do anything, but at the same time, you won't do anything. You will do the things that will keep you that trust mm. because it's so valuable and so rare that you'll want to keep it as high as you can. Hmm. Hmm. So, uh, so when people ask questions, like Kevin Simcock asks the question, uh, as everything becomes commodified, everything becomes vanilla, uh, can trust be built on creativity? Uh, th this could be read a bunch of different ways, uh, but let's assume that um, what Kevin means is that, and Kevin, if I'm wrong on this, please forgive me. But what I'm interested in this question is when we get 
get down to this human element, um, where does creativity play in that? Like, can, can we get not just clever, but creative? Um, so with this is actually a great well, question. That human factor. Yeah, I agree. It, it is. What it's a think? great, it's, it, it, it's a question where you look at it and you go, yes, that is an inevitable part of everything becoming commodified. So you're looking at it as content in general becomes commodified. So because it is commodified, it becomes vanilla and you have seen all the top 10 posts and you've seen all the other things and so on. Uh, the way that I look at, like to look at it is a, as a kind of ecosystem where everything is a species. So you've got the species of top 10 lists and you've got a species of infographics and you've got the species of reality TV. And all of these things, as they multiply, they multiply because they are effective at what they do inside of their environment. And then once they're no longer really effective in the environment and what they do is the status quo, they shrink, right? Like the, Simps the Simpsons was, was radically amazing because it was so different than everything else. And people were like, wow, and it got so big that it almost took over the entire thing. And all you could think or talk about was The Simpsons. And eventually, because it became the status quo, it was like, and just sort of shut itself down. So what you're looking at is a constantly evolving kind of ocean where you have to be able to create something that is different and interesting and original. And that's a very, very difficult thing. Thankfully, creativity is the one angle that, or one of the angles that will always be looking for the new and therefore to be able to know how to become creative if such a thing can be said, like using like Edward de Bono techniques or using whatever, will help you keep yourself on the edge of everything that you do. Hmm. Fantastic. I, uh, I have a blog post a while back on, um, on that ecosystem idea. And uh, I just put through that up in the, uh, in the chat room. So uh, if that's helpful for you guys, go ahead and snag it. And we're almost done. So I can only get a couple more questions. I apologize. We can't take as many as I'd prefer, but um, Maura Kate asked the question. One second, let me get this here and there we go. Uh, can you speak a bit more regarding strategies to becoming known where to put your efforts? And I, the reason I love Maura's question is, is Julian is, um, on a concrete kind of on the ground level, what could I do today? Uh, and, and really where I'd really like to, extend, um, I know, you're, you know, you're a very creative individual. You do a lot of things, uh, written and otherwise. And, um, I know you have a lot of photographer friends. What would you tell somebody who's feeling really invisible and are, is really interested in, in making concrete steps in the next three months, uh, to be moving in the direction of building trust? What would, how would you advise them? What would... Okay, so first of all, they have to define themselves differently than everyone else. Because a big part of it is a, an issue of contrast. So it says she's feeling invisible, right? So if she's feeling invisible. The reason she feels invisible is because mm -hmm. she feels like she is the status quo. And that she feels like she's like maybe whatever she does is not being noticed the way that it, sh that it should be noticed or something like that. The first thing to do is to actually take the the real effort and look at your own stuff that you do, whether it be the work or whether it be, you know, any other aspect of your business or whatever it is trying to, you're trying to become known for and say, is this actually interesting? If it is not actually interesting, then the reality is, is like I said about this ecosystem, your species does not deserve to become known. It no. just doesn't. You have no right to attention. You much you have no choice but to capture attention and to almost force the eye to look in your direction. It's a very difficult thing. I mean, the public eye kind of thing. And what that requires mm -hmm. is a disruption, some kind of disruption that is different than anything else. I don't care what it is. Uh, sometimes you can either social proof what you are doing in order to have more credibility than the next person or, you know, things like testimonials work, like all of these different things that are, that are sort of, when you look at it, you go, huh. That's really different than what I usually see. Another way to do this is, uh, is, is to become, is to do a kind of insiderism. With the question that we asked before about commodification, is everything becomes vanilla. So what mm -hmm. happens is you get this sort of globalized sort of white bread culture where some most people or a great deal of people try to apply it and appeal to everyone. And then you get a bunch of different subcultures that have kind of really extreme jokes and really extreme things that they do that are only interestingly funny inside of their own actual spheres. So you could look at like, I don't know, like 4chan or something like that, for examples of this. And 
just yeah. look at it and go, the only way that I can do it is I have a choice. I can appear and sorry, I can appeal to this massive white bread culture, or I can either create and sort of, I don't know, I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to create an infographic over here. Uh, I can either ap mm -hmm. appeal to the white bread culture, or I can either create or parasite upon an existing microculture and do something within that, and then slowly try to take what I do from this small space, which is significantly more effective, and then try to bring it into the center. So this is what we did back, you know, Chris Brogan and I back in the day is like, get known to a bunch of podcasters and video bloggers, gain a certain amount of influence in the, within that space, get known within that space, which is very easy because it's small and quickly growing. It's the same thing with Twitter. Mm -hmm. The reason that I'm at Julian is not because I'm special. It's just because I happen to know about it before everyone else that's probably listening to this right now. And I did that by being an insider. Mm -hmm. So get known with insiders, deep insiders, work within insiders to get to the center of one specific space. I have a trick that I just found in order to help mm -hmm. this, which is, uh, which is ask the most popular person that you know. Like, let's say that... Dane, you're the most popular person that I know. I would go to you and I would say, okay, Dane, who's the most popular person that you know? I would say, who would be the most interesting person that you know? And then you would introduce me to that person. Keep in mind, I have a certain trust with you already. Okay. And then I, what I'm doing is I'm going up the sure. ladder over and over and over again. And actually, uh, Seth Godin told me an interesting story about this, which I don't have the time to tell, but it's, it's a very effective tactic. And then what you're doing is you're getting more and more popular inside of this little microsphere and then sort of pull that and use it towards the white bread culture to try and get as much social proof out of the white bread culture and then return to the thing and go, well, now I've gone to this other world and I have, you know, I don't know, New York Times bestseller on top of the thing. Look how much more popular that makes me. And so you're switching back and forth, mm -hmm. getting credibility from the insiderism to bring it to the center and then getting the credibility in the center to bring it back to the insiders over and over and over again. You know, I love, it's funny that you say that and uh, the example of, of uh, I'd love to hear that story someday about Seth because the reason I found Chris Brogan in the very first place was sometime, Chris, or, or Seth was very kind. He actually endorsed my first book and um, one of the questions that I had for him is who should I be paying attention to? And uh, he didn't answer it directly, uh, but I did notice at that point his Twitter account that was not active at that point. He just had at that, I think he had 40,000 followers or something and he hadn't done a single tweet. And <laughs> he, um, but I looked at, he had, what he said was, uh, he didn't say anything in the tweet, but he did say something by who he was following. And he was only, so I, I noticed that, went and started following Chris Brogan, which led to obviously paying attention to him and meeting you and trust agents and blah, blah, blah. And uh, it's exactly what you're describing. So if you were to come to me and say, who do you know and who do you trust the most? Uh, who's the most influential? I'd probably say someone like Seth. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. And here we are trusting you in this conversation. So that's exactly that, right. Like, yeah. Just, you're, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I was going to with, with um, you mentioned your cussing thing or whatever. I, I, you're just a very believable guy. I, I remember when we would actually come up to you and say, just introduce myself and say, look, it's just nice to know that there's another, there's a person who I aspire to be like, like that, that there's uh, yeah. you, you want to be legit and real and, and you care a lot about people and small business guys and people small. I, I just can't thank you enough for this conversation. Cause it's, it's really, it's validating, but it's also encouraging. Like, gosh, what, what else could we be doing? How f much further could we go to build this kind of trust and equity with people? Yeah. Um, so I, that's what I was going to say. But I think I'm, I'm fearful that I cut off what you were going to say, which was probably more interesting. So. Oh, I mean, I don't, I don't know about that. I, I, I think you're right that it's like it's, it's interesting because maybe it is like it comes from being like other, being like other people, but then be, not being exactly like other people because being like exactly like other people is boring. So it's like that guy is like me. But, you know, like I just walked 800 kilometers in Spain over a period of about 35 days. So it's like he's like me, but mm -hmm. he also does this really crazy thing. Too much not like you when I become the enigma. You know that guy with all the, with all the, the puzzle pieces tattooed all over his body? Like that's the extreme mm -hmm. of me. Mm -hmm. And at which point I'm no longer like you and I'm no longer interesting to you even. I'm, I'm just like really like maybe scary to some people or something like that. So you have to kind of – it's weird because you have right. to – the way I described it – 
is to a friend of mine who is an interesting situation. As I said, uh, like in Mad Men, you know, there's Sterling and Cooper, and Sterling is in the front, and uh, he is mm-hmm. always uh, talking to the client, and he's always doing all this other stuff. And then you go to the back, and you go, and Cooper is in the back, and he's sitting there with no shoes on, and he's got a bunch of Japanese prints, and he's reading uh, poetry by uh, by Frank O'Hara, and you're looking at him, and you're going, he comes from yeah, another world. Right. Yeah, right, and Ayn Rand. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and he go, you go, he comes from another world. So he has other kind of, it's like he's gone through the hero's journey. You know what I mean? He's gone through this epic quest, mm-hmm. and he's mm-hmm. found something that none of us have. And then you look at Sterling, and, and that makes Sterling really kind of almost despicable by comparison, because he is he's trying to please you too mm-hmm. much. Trying to, don't try to be like Sterling. Always try to be like Cooper and be an outsider that brings something new and interesting in while still remaining somewhat like you. I don't know if this had anything to do with the question, but I thought it was mm-hmm. interesting. Well, at the very least, we got to talk um, Mad Men lore, which is actually yeah. more interesting than probably all of this. So I, I think I think it's perfect. Hey, um, um, I, I do want to be respectful of your time, uh, real quick, and I but I want I couldn't resist, but I think I'm... Chris have Chris and, he... and I have two things that we're working on at the same time. One of them is a project for the domino. For one is a book for the domino project, which are not really books. They're kind of like yeah. short books, and that's almost done. And uh, then the oh. thank you, Michelle. She says everything you're saying is interesting. I'm like, like you don't know what I'm like in real life. Uh, <laughs> if you're getting the best hour, all the best hour of me. This is all I got. So uh, then the second one we're working on is a traditional book with Portfolio, which is a big publisher. And the work with Seth is coming out by the Domino Project. I'm supremely interested in getting, uh, I can't really talk much about it, but I don't even know if I could say the title mm-hmm. even. It, like, it's freaking me out even to talk about it like I'm, like I'm cursing it. But uh, it is really deeply interesting uh-huh. to me. And, and uh, like more work has gone into this than maybe anything that I've ever done. So it is, uh, it's something that I, I, mm. I will be extremely proud of when it's completed. And I'm looking forward to hearing your opinion on it. Please mm. follow me on my blog. Uh, I'm going to put it into mm. the chat here. It's inoveryourhead.net. Type your email address on the side, and you'll get my cool stuff. And uh, then pay attention to Chris Brogan as well. And, uh, of course, both of us are more than keen to hear your criticisms or whatever else. You know, There's a lot of good – You know, on the Internet, mm. it's kind of the best way to get new and interesting ideas. So I'd like to be able to – spread some out most yeah. of them don't even come from me i just read so much and then I'll, every little while i get something for myself so hmm. julian is there any chance when the when the new piece comes out uh that we could get you or maybe you and chris uh back on i'd love to especially in the heels of the domino project it'd be fun to to talk to you about this idea because i think you piqued a lot of interest uh might you be open to coming back on the show my pleasure i would love to for sure all right all right well, I, I do want to honor your time. We're going to get off now. Um, there's a lot of folks that are excited that, that you're jumping on. And uh, uh, thank you so much for being here, man. And, and just thanks for being a cool guy. And uh, if I had the courage, I'd, I'd get some, uh, some ink done just to be more like you, I think. But uh, I don't know that I have that, that courage. So uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes between now and next time. Hey, following at Julian, of course, his blog is mentioned. And, uh, I, I, and if you haven't... Uh, you should be you should be snagging it um, sooner than later. You'll be you'll be glad you did. It's worth worth its weight. Uh, thanks again, Julian, and uh, we'll see all you guys next time. Thanks for having me. Peace out.